Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us. And Lord, thank you for uh, for saving us. Thank you for saving us. It's uh, <laughs> a wonderful, wonderful gift. Thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, we ask you to open the eyes and ears and hearts of our understanding that we may receive more of you this day. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. God bless God. Today we're going to look at uh, 1 Thessalonians talks about a rapture where uh, a group of people, saints, I'll say in the morning again, will be taken up into the heaven for, uh, for God's purpose and then probably brought back down again uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to rule and reign for a thousand years in millennium. Well, uh, this is what we call uh, the, the rapture. It's the, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but a lot of words that we use aren't in the Bible. It's called rapture. And what we found here is, is that uh, I want to read to you the, the rapture prophecies of Isaiah and Jeremiah, who were two really great prophets of the Old Testament. Okay? So let's begin with Isaiah's prophecy and the life indicators at the time of the rapture. In other words... Isaiah is going to prophesy about the rapture occurring, taking out the saints, taking out all the saints. That's also called the first resurrection, taking out all the saints. And uh, well, he, what, uh, what I was, uh, Isaiah did was he gave us some circumstances, some living circumstances that will be occurring during this period. So let's read this now, shall we? Isaiah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away... Now I'll read all the black print first. That's the, that's the Bible. Then we'll go back and explain it. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water, the mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of fifty and the honorable man, and the counselor, and the carnean artificer, and the eloquent orator. So what Isaiah is telling us here when he starts off, he's saying the Lord is going to take away from Jerusalem and Judah, J Jerusalem being the capital city and Judah being a composite of all saved born again people. Okay, What's he going to take away from them? Well, let's, let's start from the beginning. For behold, the Lord of hope, the, the Lord of hosts doth take away. To take away means, in the Hebrew, it means to turn off, to call back, to pluck away. Pluck is real important. That, that's Harpazio in the New Testament about uh, being raptured. Um, to pluck away, to withdraw. So the Lord is going to withdraw an element of the population that exists in this world today. And then he follows to describe who those elements actually are. And they're coming from Jerusalem and from Judah. Okay? And now it says here, uh, and that the Lord doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay. And stay means in the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for it is mishan, and it means support. It is the sustenance, figuratively the sustenance, to take away the stay and the staff. And, and the staff, the Hebrew word is, is very close to stay. It's mishnana, and it means support, figuratively sustenance, a walking stick. So the Lord is going to take away these things that are supporting. It's like this. Who supports the church, for example? The officials, the church officials, the pastor and the, the deacon, board deacons and the elders and so forth and so on. Those are the kinds of people that God is going to take away. And he goes on to describe them now because they apply to everybody. He says the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. So they're all going to be taken away. The mighty man and the man of war, the judge and the prophet, and the prudent and the ancient, the captain of 50 and the honorable man, and the counselor and the cunning artificer, an artificer means in the Hebrew fabricator, that is the carpenter or the craftsman, the engraver, the mason, the smith. Okay, these are all artificers. And the eloquent orator. 
God says you're going to take them all away. And all these people are saved, born again, children of God. And positions of leadership. Go going to take them all away. So that's kind of an indication right there. Then what's going to happen next? Isaiah chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. And in their place, now, and I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And now we're getting into the living circumstances at the time of this rapture. And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. And babes in the Hebrew means with caprice, with vexation, a tyrant, a delusional. It's, it's children who are ruling over them. Okay, I'll give children to be their princes and babes to rule over them, and the people shall be oppressed. And in the Hebrew, this word actually means taxed, harassed, distressed, raiser of taxes, and taskmaster. Taskmaster. So times are going to get tough. And the taxes, of course, are going to be raised. The taxes are always being raised. Now, what we're doing now is we're taking what Isaiah is saying here and applying it to every day today. See if this is really rings true for today. Is this the time? Okay. And the people shall be oppressed one by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Let me go back to that about everyone by his neighbor. You do that. Lots of us here are, are a little older and remember when our neighbors were our friends. And we didn't lock our doors when we, when we left the house. And we never locked the cars up. And never, nobody ever locked cars up any place. And, and we just left everything open and, and because your neighbor was your friend. Is it that way now? Now we lock up everything, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> Several times we lock up everything. So times and circumstances are changed now. And that's what he's saying here, okay? And he's continuing now. Everyone by another and everyone by his, this is oppressed now, everyone by another and everyone by his neighbor. The child shall bear himself, behave himself proudly against the ancient. We see this happening all the time now. Kids telling off their, their, their parents, uh, they're disobeying, they're... they're uh, and not necessarily just parents, but just older people. Just, just uh, 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 if you go for job interviews, or any, all, ki all kinds of things. Disrespect. Used to be elders were respected in our society for thousands and thousands of years because they had all the wisdom, accumulated wisdom. Well, they still have the accumulated wisdom, but now the children don't respect them at all. Foolish old men, foolish old women. And that's the attitude now. Wow. That's kind of hitting it right in the head here, isn't it? Let's see. <clears throat> the child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. Base means the low, the just low, low moral moral person against the honorable. When a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, "Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler." And let this ruin be under your, thy hand. Uh, what, what, what's happening here is things are so tough. Uh, uh, they don't have uh, uh, the people don't have much, and they're looking for someone else to be in charge so they can blame them for their problems. Thou hast clothing, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In that day, shall he swear, saying. So this man return and say, I will not be a healer, a healer. I won't help you with your problems. Healer does not just strictly physical, but mental as well, and all the other kinds of problems that we have. Your neighbor doesn't help anymore. Your, your, lots of times our families don't help anymore. What's happening to the family? The families are getting broken up. Never before was it like that. It was a, the family was the, the core unit of the society. And now the family's being broken up like crazy by half the people in the United States, half the, uh, I think the statistic is half the women are unmarried. Uh, uh, ha half, all the women are, are unmarried. No families, no families. How many, how many women are bringing up children on their own? Or how many men, for that matter, are doing the same thing? Families are being busted up right and left. It's, 
Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That's Judges. That's the last verse in the book of Judges. There was no king in Israel. No king, no God. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And when everybody's doing their own right thing, not obeying a particular set morality, standard of morality, things get, chaos is coming. And chaos, I want to tell you, is here now. We're in this situation. And that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. Of course, now the children are the rulers. Excuse me just a minute. What do we have as rulers today? Have you been watching television? Have you been watching the, uh, <laughs> the elections? The, uh, the preliminary elections for all these people that are running for President of the United States? Talk about children. Talk about children. These are people who are actually wanting to represent you as to be President of the United States of America. They are number one, every one of them, every one of them, out and out liars. They're all lying like crazy, every single one. There isn't one of them is telling the truth. That's the start of it. And then they're lying and back and forth and going this and that. And, all up there, there, and they're uh, taunting each other and calling each other names. Just like kids do when they're five years old. Well, you, you, this, that, you, you, oh, his mommy, did, yeah, and he's rattling, rattling, rattling back and forth. They're children. And they're want to be our rulers. And in fact, they are our rulers. And now they're vying for the top spot. Gee, sounds like that's uh, right here. Okay, go on to verses, uh, Isaiah chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen. Talking now about the church and Christians. For Jerusalem is ruined, and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord. Because their tongue, their words, and their deeds are against the Lord. This is Christians now. who are out there doing all kinds of nasty, bad things. And more and more. Because it's easier and easier to do. Because everybody else is doing it. So, you've got to get there first. Do unto them or, or, or they'll get you. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. The show of their countenance does witness against them. Now, I took, I took that same verse and we went to the Amplified Bible. And this is what the Bible says that verse means. The show of their countenance does witness against them. Amplified says it this way. They're respecting their persons and showing a partiality witnesses against them. Isn't that the truth? Look at these people up there running for political office and, and all the people who are in offices. Respect their persons, aren't they all? Everybody's got a little place here for a little graft. Give me a couple of bucks and I'll do this, that, and so on and so on. And it's, it's accepted. It's the way of life nowadays. Respect their persons. Respect their persons and showing par partiality. That's what life is all about nowadays. There's no even thing like, where's, what happened to justice and, and, and fairness and, and the law? Gone. Obama got rid of that by his own example for the last seven years. Lawless, completely lawless man. Doesn't obey any law except his own. Period. That's it. And he makes them up as he goes on top of it. Lawless society. We are becoming a lawless society. The show of their countenance does witness against them, their appearance, and they declare their sin as Sodom. Declare means that they stand, in the Hebrew it means stand boldly, they announce, they profess their sin as Sodom. What was the sin of Sodom? Homosexuality. Okay. What was the, what was the, uh, but the, the basis of that is, is disbelief in God's laws. You see, against God, against life. And so what we have here is we have the same thing now. We've had it since 19, uh, I think 90, when the Clintons, 92, when the Clintons came into power. 
homosexuality coming out as a one of the most powerful lobbies in the United States of America. And they're not embarrassed to say that they're homosexuals. They're proud of it. They have parades down here every year, right down here in St. Petersburg and over in Tampa. Big break, gay parades, pride. Because they're proud of coming against God. And they proclaim it. Now, you listen, you know, these are things that are all against God that we're talking about. How long do you think God's going to put up with this kind of stuff? We used to be a Christian nation back in the 50s and 60s. In the 70s, we started to turn. In the 80s, even a little more. In the 90s, we used to be a Christian nation. We are no longer a Christian nation. In the Bible, every time a, a nation turns against God, <coughs> down they go. Every time. Every time. We're going down the tubes. And they declare their sin is Sodom. They announce that they stand boldly. They profess their sin is Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Because that's the reward that they're going to get. That's the payoff in the end. Evil unto themselves. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with him. Now, righteous means saved and born again. Everybody here who's righteous, raise your hand. Because you're a saint, a saint of God. You're a saint of God. God's made you righteous. Even though you're a sinner, we're all sinners, okay? But most assuredly, since you got saved, you, you sin less and less and less. In other words, you're coming closer and closer to God. We have been made righteous. This is it. Let's read this now. Say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Are our doings good or bad? Good or evil? Good. And we shall eat that fruit. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands shall be given him. He's going to get what he earned. As for my people, now here's the summation. As for my people, children are their oppressors. And women rule over them. Now, if we have to understand here. We have to look at this, this statement, and women rule over them from God's point of view. God placed the woman number two in the hierarchy of authority, okay, under Adam. He placed Eve under Adam, okay? She's covered by Adam. Adam's covered by God. Man is covered by God. And the, uh, 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 the part of the curse was that the, the woman shall long, long for, the, for the man. So her desire should be to the man, and he shall rule over her. That's part of it. Why? The Bible says the woman is a weaker vessel. That's what the Bible says. That's what God said. I didn't say that. But you can't get mad to me. God said the woman is a weaker vessel. How come? Because she transgressed first and led Adam into doing the same thing. The weaker vessel. Does it make sense if you have any type of an organization, and of course an organization is based on a, a hierarchy of authority, to put the person in charge, the weaker person? Does that make sense at all? Not in any kind of organization I ever saw. The man is in charge. That's why uh, the, uh, the apostle says that uh, the woman shall not speak uh, uh, shall not teach, okay, men. 
because she's usurping the position of a man. Now, we're getting back here again to what I thought 15 years ago I saw, and I'm still seeing it. I'm seeing that the abomination of desolation is about to come up, Matthew chapter 24. And I think that the abomination of desolation, I've, always, I've said this for years now, is a woman becoming president of the United States of America. Now, why would I say that? Well, the uh, president of the United States of America is the most powerful office in the whole world. Most powerful office in the whole world, okay? Nowhere in the Bible has there ever been a woman priest, a female priest, or uh, a, a head of the, the, the synagogue or anything at all like that. Nothing. Nowhere at all. And never will be. Because that's the weaker vessel. Why would God allow that to happen? But we're going to see that, I think. And I think what's going to happen is, I think Hillary's going to win this election. And when she does, immediately you start to go, you take your open your Bibles and read Matthew 24 and see what happens. Immediately, as soon, in fact, I'll read it for you so, so you know. Matthew 24, verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever readeth, let him understand. Stand in the holy place. The holy place was the actual most powerful office of the land at that time. Now, that was a, a religious office, but now, the, now what's happening is the world has become secular, and the world's holy place is the office of the President of the United States. Okay? It's the most powerful office. And it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Now he's talking to them in Judea. That's Christians, us. He says, but then, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. In other words, if you're on the housetop, abomination and desolation appears, woman gets elected president, take off. Don't go downstairs and pack your bags and say, I need this and I don't need this. I need a razor over here. No, no, no. Don't do that. Say, just take off. He said, he, this is... This is, it's like, how will I say? It's like, it's a, it's a, evacuate. You're about to be decimated. Evacuate as soon as possible. Don't stop for anything. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto, the, uh, unto them that are with child and them that get stuck in those days because they can't move fast. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us right now. But boy, it sure is going to mean something come November. Now, I'm not saying this is what's going to happen. But it has been my thought that that's what's going to happen for the last 15 years now. That one day we're going to elect a female president of the United States. And for my mind, that's the abomination of desolation. Because so that's God's house. The highest position in the land is God's... <laughs> The high priest, it's God's. It's a total reversal of how God wanted it to be and ordained it to be. Now, I could be wrong and that not happen. And if that doesn't happen, then okay. But I think it's going to happen. Because why? Because I read the Bible. And it says here, whosoever readeth, let him understand. You have to understand about the holiness of God. Say ye to the righteous, he shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe well unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. 
As for my people, children are their oppressors. That's all we've got now. Kids uh, and mental, uh, immature uh, uh, adults is what they are. But they're, they're mentally five, ten years, they act like ten year olds, five years old. Children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Thy path at least to God. Thy path at least to God. That was uh, Isaiah's prophecy. And, and I've looked at it and I said, why, this is the rapture. He's prophesying the rapture. Well, the first thing that's going to happen is, is all what's happening is God's going to rapture out. Christians are going to be raptured out. And they're going to go to some place, heaven in, 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 a, in a fashion, okay, and be I, I continue to be trained up, all right? And then what's going to happen is Well, he didn't say what was going to happen after that. Now, let's, let's, let's look to Jeremiah's parable and see what's going to happen then. Now, this is a little different orientation. This is a historical thing, okay? Jeremiah's parable, his prophecy of the rapture. This also, this follows right in, in the Bible, uh, Isaiah's prophecy. And this is taken from the Full Life Buddy Study Bible. The historical background for the parable of the two baskets of figs, that's what we're going to read, is the beginning of Zedekiah's reign, King Zedekiah over Judah. Nebuchadnezzar had just deported Jehoiakim and many who was, who was a king and many other Israelites to Babylon in 597 BC. Zedekiah and those who remained behind had been spared the judgment of God. Thus they believed Jeremiah's prophecy of total destruction, prophecies of total destruction were misguided. Jeremiah had been saying total destruction is coming, total destruction is coming. They thought he, he was wrong. Jeremiah warned that those left in Ju Jerusalem would experience a far more devastating judgment than those who had already gone into exile in Babylon. I'm going to show you where that first exile in five, there were two exiles. In 597, they exiled, well, here's what they exiled, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, and so on so on. They took all the princes, they took all the important people to Babylon to train them, to purify them. God sent them. Now, we're going to read that. Let me just read this now. Okay. Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 3. The Lord showed me, and behold, two baskets of figs were set before the temple of the Lord. After that, Nebuchadnezzar, Nezer, king of Babylon, had carried away captive Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. So two baskets were set before the temple after uh, Jeho uh, Jeho uh, Jehoiah was uh, taken to Babylon. And what was who was taken to Babylon? The king, the king Jeho who was Jehoiah, king at the time. The king was taken to Babylon. And the princes of Judah, princes were taking time, and the carpenters, and the smiths, blacksmith, wordsmith, this smith, that smith. Gee, that kind of parallels what uh, Isaiah said. different categories, but it parallels what Isaiah said. And so what had been carried away captive in, in 597 B.C., uh, 587, I should say, no, oh, all right. yeah, 587 B.C., uh, were uh, the king and the princes and the carpenters and the smiths, all the important men again, Okay. They were taken from Jerusalem, from Jerusalem, not and from Judah, not from the, uh, any other tribes, but they were taken from the saved, born-again people, in that sense of the word. 
and had brought them to Babylon. One basket had very good, and look at the two baskets again. One basket had very good figs, even like the figs that are first ripe. And the other basket had very naughty figs, bad figs, rotten figs, which could not be eaten. They were so bad. Then said the Lord unto me, What seest thou, Jeremiah? And I said, Figs. The good figs, very good. And the evil, very evil. They cannot be eaten. They are so evil. Now I'm going to stop there and look at the commentary again from the Full Life Buddy, uh, Bible, Study Bible. Two baskets of figs. The first basket of figs, and that was the exiles of 587, the first exile, that's the raptured kinds of folks, okay, was considered to contain good figs. Good in that God would purify them through the suffering of the exile. Notice that? God would purify them. That's why they were sent. That's why they were taken up, so that God would purify them so that, uh, through the suffering that they were going to suffer through being exiled to Babylon. After their exile, they would be brought back into the land and would turn from idolatry to God with all their hearts. After This is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ now. First he comes down for the rapture, and then he comes down with all the saints with him. Remember those verses? He comes with all the armies with him. Okay, God would use them to accomplish his, because they've been, they've been purified now. God would use them to accomplish his redemptive purpose in the world. The second basket of figs had bad figs and represented King Jedekiah, Zedekiah and those who remained in Jerusalem after that recent deportation. So some remained under King Zedekiah and others left, were sent by God. And God says it. I'll, I'll read it down in a minute. They, could, they, could, they, would, they would continue to oppose Jeremiah. The people who were left would continue to oppose Jeremiah and his message and thus experienced the incredible horrors of the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., bringing great disgrace. My commentary, the good figs represent God's chosen people who have been imputed for righteousness. That's born again in the Old Testament. We're still imputed for righteousness in the New Testament as well. Just a phrase, okay? The good figs represent God's chosen people who have been imputed for righteousness but are not yet glorified. I need to continue the process of their redemption unto completion. In other words, they haven't completed their, redem their redemption. The process of our redemption is depicted in the tabernacle of God as justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification here, as you enter in, you're justified, you're made, right, made righteous right here uh, at the at, uh, brazen altar. And then you're sanctified by, by Jesus Christ, you're made righteous. And then you're sanctified at the brazen labor by the Holy Spirit, and you're glorified in, in the uh, Ark of the Covenant by God Himself. That's the process that we go through. We get saved, and then the process of sanctification separates us from our sin, little by little by little. It's happening to me, it's happening to you sometimes, and it's, no, <laughs> it's happening to you. We're all going through that process where we're being sanctified little by little by little. Here little and, and there little. And that's purifying us. It's making us pure. Okay? And then, once we die, we're glorified by Father God. By Father God. All right. So, reading now uh, what, what uh, uh, Jeremiah has said so far, he left, we left off, and I said, figs, the good figs, are very good, and the evil, they're very evil, and they cannot be eaten, they're, they're so evil. Now we go to Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 4 through 7, and we look at the rapture in Jeremiah's terms, which is the first resurrection. All the saints will be resurrected during the first resurrection. <coughs> Taken up. Jeremiah 24, verse 4 through 7. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, wait a minute. Who is the word of the Lord? Who is the word of the Lord? John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
The Lord of the Lord is Jesus Christ. And the word of the Lord came unto me, this is Jeremiah talking now, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel. Now he's talking, thus saith the Lord, that's Jehovah, the God of Israel. Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. Ooh, now there's a, there's a statement right there. He said, because now he's looking at the, the differences. Like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them. Acknowledge means in Hebrew, I will scrutinize them. I will care for them. I will look at them intently. I will regard them. I will respect them. Why? Because we're saints. That's us. We're the good figs. So will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive of Judah, whom I have sent. I have sent, difference there, whom I have sent out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans, that's Babylon. Why? For their good. Because the saints have been getting just like the, the people who weren't saints. All this stuff around them, all this uh, sin and all, all the, the, the all the bad things happened around them were affecting them and they were starting to do the same kinds of things. They were falling away from God. And so what God did is he took the saints, all the saints, and he separated them. He sent them away to Babylon. Now, from their point of view, they were being captured and killed and all this other kind of stuff, but that's all right. From God's point of view, he sent them. Why did he send them? He sent them For their good. That's the rapture. <clears throat> it's going to complete us. When we get plucked up, pulled away, sent by God, He's going to complete us. We're going to have, He's going to receive the full mind of Christ and a brand new body. For our good. For our good. Okay, now let's continue here. Let's see what I'm saying. I have sent them out of this place into the land of the Chaldeans for their good. For I will set my eyes upon them for good. And I will bring them back again. Whoa, look at that. And I will bring them back again to this land. So they're going to go up. We're going to go up. And we're going to come back. We're going to come back. That's why the Bible says, I think, five times, four or five times, mostly in the Old Testament, that those of us who are raptured aren't going to, no, like this, the good shall never leave the land, or uh, the saved or the born again, whatever it is. We are not ever going to leave the land, just get raptured away and not come back. We're going to come back. I should have looked up those verses for you. Perhaps I will next time. But just look at it like this. For I will set my eyes upon them for good, and I will bring them again to this land, and I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. And I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people. And I will be their God. For they shall return unto me with their whole heart. God wants to purify us. And I'm seeing this rapture as the last step in that purification process. Because the rapture is also the first resurrection. I'm seeing that <clears throat> it's going to be the completion of our purification. And then we're going to come back with the Lord and his armies. That's what it says. And I will bring them back again to the land. Now let's look about those people who are left behind. Ooh, remember the left behind thing? 
How about let's look at because what happened is he took these these people in uh, 587 BC up uh, and sent them to to Babylon. But how about the people who are left behind? Let's look at what happened about them. Let's read about those who are left behind. Jeremiah chapter 24 verses 8 through 10. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so evil. Surely, thus saith the Lord, so will I give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes. Now, these are the ones who were left. So I will give Zedekiah the king of Judah and his princes and the residue of Jerusalem, all the rest of Jerusalem, all the people left behind, that remain in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt, lump them in two, the people, the unsaved people in the land of Egypt, which is a symbol of unsavedness, and I will deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. H-U-R-T. For their hurt. And to be a reproach and a proverb and a taunt and a curse in all places whither I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they be consumed. And that means in the Hebrew, utterly consumed. Till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. Wow. You see that? That's what's happening. Now, Isaiah gave us some pretty good indicators of what life was going to be like when this taking away, when this sending away, when this plucking away should occur when we we're raptured. What were they again? Well, he says here, where am I looking here now? Oh, it says, oh, 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 well, Isaiah does, he describes whom, who will be taken away of the, 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the saints, okay? And he also describes the homosexual problem that we, we have been facing for 20 some years now. And Jeremiah describes two groups of figs the good figs and the bad figs. And tells us what's going to happen. This is prophecy. Isaiah and Jeremiah were two of the greatest, in fact, they may well have been the greatest prophets other than Jesus Christ and Moses that we had. And they're prophesying about something that nobody's talking about. They're prophesying about the rapture and taking, separating into two groups, saved and the unsaved. And this is going to be occur at the first resurrection. And we're going to come back and rule and reign. And we're going to come back and rule and reign for a thousand years on this earth. When we come back again, as so prophesied by Jeremiah, we're going to come back, and because we'll have the full mind of Christ then and new bodies, we're going to come back and rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. That's you. That's you, 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 you. You, 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 who, who maybe you live underneath a tree right now. Or maybe you live in the back, back seat of a car someplace, or you share an apartment with someone, or you're this, that, or whatever, or you don't have any place to live, and you're just looking for a place, and you don't have any food, and you don't have any money. But God chose you. And you become a saved, born-again child of God. So regardless of your position right now, we're talking about you. You're a good fig. You have the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. This world just don't matter. I mean, it doesn't don't matter in how I put it like that. It matters in terms of what you do on this world affects what happens to you in all eternity. Very much so. 
because you only got a few years to get right with God. And not everybody's ever going to get perfect with God. We're just going to get each little bit righter as, as we can. So we're always, always going to have faults until we get taken out of here. But the Lord wants you to change your ways. He says, listen, you want to get left behind? You want to get left behind like those other people got left behind? They got destroyed. They got destroyed. Obey. Obey. You have been privileged to have been selected, elected, the word is, by Jesus Christ to be a saved, born-again child of God. From where? From the foundation of the world. God knew you were going to be saved and born again. Now what God's asking you to do is act like it. You're in school. Every one of us is in school right now, me included. We're all in school. We're studying to show ourselves approved. That's what the Bible says. It's a study to show thyself approved. Approved by who? By God. What do you mean study? Study means open the book and read it and then do whatever you need to do after that. Some of you are going to die. Maybe tonight. Maybe tomorrow, the day after. That's it. No more time. If you knew you were going to die a week from now, what would you be doing? Well, you'd be going home this afternoon and reading open the Bible. <laughs> See? Well, I got news for you. You might. And you only have you have another thing as well. The Lord Jesus Christ is about to return. Now, when he comes, that's it. Suddenly, that's the end of it. It's like in the twinkling of an eye, we'll be changed. Okay? But we won't have any more opportunities to study. I mean, to study. Well, that's what I said. We won't have any more opportunities like that. Study now. Read the Bible. Talk to God. Talk to your friends and neighbors and relatives who are saved and born again. And look forward to your wonderful future. You have a wonderful future waiting for you. Everyone, oh, just beyond description. I can't describe it. I mean, the Bible can't even describe it to us because it's beyond our comprehension. It's so wonderful. But it is, the Bible does say, it's, it's happiness and joy. Don't you want? What do we want out of life? I mean, we want happiness and joy. The guy who, who works at the factory and makes a, uh, $8 an hour wants happiness and joy. The guy who uh, has his own business and makes $2 million a year, he wants happiness and joy. This is where you find, this is where I found it. I had everything. I had everything the world could, could say to have. I had that. And you know what? I wasn't happy. I kept wanting more. For what? And I wasn't happy. Look at the, uh, the Clintons, for example, who are wealthy beyond our imagination, so wealthy. They have so much money, they know. Uh, this. So, so what are they doing? Are they happy? They don't act like very happy people to me. How about you? You think you're happy? Yelling and shouting at each other and, and at everybody else and doing all this stuff. And they got all kinds of uh, more money than anybody else and maybe the whole world. Who knows? No happiness and joy. So what are they doing? They're after more. More of what? What are they going to do with an extra $50 million? <laughs> Nothing. Just going to sit there. But that's all they know. See, they don't know this. This is where the happiness and joy is. Here, it's here. It's not in things. It's not in other people. It's in God. And it's all available to each one of you. You just have to open up and read it. You say, open up and let God talk to you. And he will talk to you if you read it. 
you came to church today. Who knows why? God knows why. God's in control. But you really don't know why. But I'll tell you why. You came for happiness and joy. In the end, you came for happiness. You were seeking happiness and joy. Perhaps not directly to, through the church. Maybe you just were hungry. You knew that we fed afterwards, so you come for the food. That's fine. Still happiness and joy. And here you are. And it's all open and available to you. And this world don't mean squat. It just don't mean squat. The only meaning this world has is here because this is just a temporary place for me. You're going to, one day I want to be gone, baby. To a place that I'm going to be at for all eternity. All eternity. A place of happiness and joy. Where are you going? I know where I'm going. I got the promises here. Happiness and joy. I'm headed there. Are you headed there too? Because he says to you, he gives you the opportunity if you want it. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 3, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That means, see means in, in the original Greek that was written, he cannot understand the kingdom of God. No idea. I didn't have any idea about the kingdom of God before I got saved, before I got born again. Well, what does it mean to be born again? The Apostle Paul explained it pretty good in Romans 10, 9. He says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's born again. Simple. Last year, our staff of evangelical students and guest speakers led 1,709 people to the Lord just last year. Last month, we led 100 people to the Lord, and we're now working on, on this, this year's total. Now, I want to tell you something. Just because someone says the words doesn't necessarily mean that they're saved, because those words have to come in and take root in your heart. See, so some of the words are going to pass right through, but others got to got to sit in your heart and take root. And that's what gets you saved when it takes root. The root is Jesus Christ. He, he dwells inside you. All right. Now, out of the 1,709 confessions of faith last year, I don't know how many people actually in reality received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Maybe all 1,709, or maybe one time, maybe, who knows? But the point is they all said it, the words, and the words themselves are seeds, S-E-E-D-S, -E -E seeds. Seed is the word of God. That's what the Bible says in Luke 8, 11. The seed is the word of God. So what you did do by saying this prayer, you took in the seeds. And maybe you didn't get saved right then and there. But maybe the next time you might. Or tomorrow you might. Or the day after. If that seed takes root and starts to grow, you're going to get saved, man. And you know what happens when you get saved? You're stuck. You can't get out of it. you got to go to heaven. That's the deal. How come I know you got to go to heaven? Because when the seed takes root, that root is named Jesus Christ. When he takes root in your heart, what do you think is going to get Jesus Christ out of your heart? Is there anything possible to get Jesus Christ? Nothing at all. To overpower Jesus Christ. Nothing at all. So you're going to go to heaven. And you're going to be a sinner. You can, you're doing bad things. And, and you continue to do bad things. You just, as you proceed, coming closer to the Lord, you just sin less and less and less and less. Perhaps very slowly, but that's what will happen to you. So I ask now, <clears throat> is there anybody here today who would like to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? I will say a little prayer that I have, and you can say this prayer with me and receive Jesus. Please raise your hand if you'd like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 
Anyone at all today? Anyone at all today? We have an internet congregation. This message is going out to every country in the world right now. And if there's anybody out there who would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I'm going to say this prayer and you can say it with me and receive Jesus. And I'm looking around at all these faces and saying, well, thank God for that. Hopefully you're all saved and born again. I mean, praise God. Isn't that wonderful? Now, and here's the evidence. You've been sitting here for over an hour listening to me. I mean, that takes a lot of, uh, <laughs> uh, what do they call it, chutzpah? Chutzpah. And most saved people, unsaved people would have gone out the door a half hour ago. So, remember now, what I did today, what we did is we seeded you with the Word of God. Those were seeds that we gave you. You didn't, you didn't get the whole thing, the whole message. I didn't get the whole message. I don't know, some of the things are, st are still puzzling me. But you got an idea and a concept. And you know what happened? You came closer to God today than you were an hour and a half ago. Everybody here is closer to God. You have a closer relationship to God now than you had an hour and a half ago. Everybody! Praise God! Hallelujah! 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 Now I'm going to say this prayer, the sinner's prayer, for those people who would like to receive Jesus uh, in the internet congregation. And if you would like to say this with me, please stand and we'll all say it together. It'll be good. You can act like the chorus of heavenly angels escorting these people to the Lord. Father God, Father God I, confess I'm a I confess I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I, believe I believe that Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ died, on died on the cross and paid the penalty, paid the penalty for, all sins, for all my sins and was resurrected. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, God, Father God, please send your Son your seed, your, seed. Your, fire, your fire, your love, your love. Into, my into my heart to be the Lord, be the Lord. And, Savior and Savior of my life. Of my life. Thank you, Father God. You, Father. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Please be seated. Please be seated. We're going to take tithes and offerings today, and uh, we do this every day. Go ahead. Um, here's the blessings. Here's what church is all about. You came here to be blessed. You got blessed. How do I know? Everybody here got blessed because you heard the Word of God. And these, these paper, these notes, and it's all right directly from the Bible. So you heard the Word of God. That's blessing in itself right there. So you're blessed. You got seed, okay? Then what happened is we prayed, and some of you prayed to God or in, on behalf of other people, but you spoke with God yourself. Another blessing. And now what God has is another blessing for you. He said, I'll the tithe now. And the tithe is a test. It's a self-test. God knows your heart. He wants you to know your heart. He says, return to me. Return means... He wants you to understand that he gave you everything that you have, and he wants you to give him back 10% of the increase. Okay? Not give him back. He says, return to me. That's why he said return. You got it over there. Um, now, what is, why does God, God need your money for? I mean, he, he needs it to buy it. You know, no, he doesn't need your money. He created money. What God wants is he needs your obedience. This is a test for your obedience because the, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. So what God says is I'm going to test you on your money now. Are you willing to return to me to sacrifice your money to me? Which puts God number one and your money number two. And if you're willing to do that, God says, now open the windows of heaven above you. That's what he said. I'll open the windows of heaven above you so that you cannot contain the blessings that will flow down upon you. 
which means that they'll fall down upon you off, off, off you onto other people around you. Praise God. Sharing the word of God just like that. If you obey me. And if you don't obey me, what he just says is a quote, would he rob God? That's what he said. Would he rob God? And they said, the people said, well, what do you mean rob God? And he said, in tithes and offerings, would you rob me? So God will be asking you that. You see, God wants to bless you, but he can't bless disobedient. He, I wouldn't say he can't. He can do anything. He won't bless disobedient children. And he says, return to me. That's not a suggestion. That's a command. That's a command. When God speaks, he doesn't suggest things. It's always a command. He says, return to me, 10%. Prove your obedience. Now, who are you proving your obedience to by doing that? God knows you. No, he did. you don't have to prove your obedience to God. He knows your heart. You're proving your obedience to you. You're the one God wants to know. He wants you to know your heart. And that's how you know your heart. If you obey God, you know your heart. Because obedience is a type of love. You obey God, you love God. If you disobey God, what's that say? That's right. Now, if you've got kids, you've got a kid that runs around and breaks a window and breaks the dishes and yells and shouts and swears at you, you say, here, have an ice cream cone? You reward that kid? The windows of heaven, therefore, will be closed above you like iron. And you only get the, the, the blessings that the unsaved people get. And that's in Matthew chapter 5. You get the, uh, uh, the, the, the sun rises in the morning on them, and it rains on them, and it's got a little grass. That's it. You want to settle for the blessings of the unsaved? But God says, but if you obey me, I'll open the windows of heaven above you so you can't contain all the blessings. And you'll be happy and joyful and wonderful. God is your God. He's your Savior. Will you obey him? And if you won't obey him, then you have a real problem. Then you have a real problem. God is looking for obedient people. That's why they call good figs, obedient people. How about the bad figs, the evil figs? Those are disobedient people. Which do you want to be? It's all there for you. Your choice. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for blessing us and saving us and loving us and Lord, we thank you we've given this, this opportunity to just uh, to serve you, Lord, and to, to hear you and to receive more of you this day, this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you, Lord, for this. And, Lord, we ask that uh, you just bless every person here with, with your happiness and joy, if they're willing to receive it. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and the Savior. Amen. Praise God. One more thing before we go. Rick, Rick Burkett, a strange fellow here in the back, would you stand and bless the food?